page J10, the tongue has many functions. We wrote mastication, deglutition, speaking, and taste buds. Mastication, what does mastication mean? Chewing. Chewing. So before we have our teeth in, we kind of chew with our tongue, uh, crush stuff with our tongue, and of course in an old person, as they lose their teeth, they start to rely on their tongue again. Uh, deglutition, very important word, it means swallowing. You should definitely know the clinical word for swallowing is deglutition. We'll have more to say about that in a moment. Our tongue is used for speaking. You know, the word that refers to the tongue is a lingual. And in fact, the study of languages is called linguistics. Uh, it's impossible to speak without your tongue. Right, So in those places in the world where they might cut somebody's tongue off, can't speak without a tongue. So uh, you have to have your tongue in order to speak. Uh, anyhow, uh, also on our tongue are taste buds. What are taste buds? Taste buds are sensory neurons. Called, uh, they are a type of chemoreceptor. Now we've learned previously that sensory neurons commonly have that ending receptor. We've mentioned, uh, uh, for example, proprioceptors, and uh, there are touch receptors and noxiceptors, and chemoreceptors are sensory neurons sensitive to chemicals. Now, uh, the, there are five types of chemoreceptors on the surface of our tongue. There are four classic tastes, and then about 12, 15 years ago, uh, a number of Japanese researchers discovered a fifth taste called umami. So uh, what is sweet, sour, salty, bitter, and umami? So the sweet uh, chemoreceptors are activated by sugars, by sugars. Now there are some chemicals that are not sugars that also activate these chemoreceptors on our tongue. Uh, th those are called artificial sweeteners because they're not really sugars, but they still stimulate or activate these uh, chemoreceptors on our tongue, so we perceive it as uh, a sweet. Uh, the, uh, there are also chemoreceptors uh, that are activated by acids that create the sensation of sour. So uh, a couple of examples of acids that have a sour flavor uh, to them is um, citric acid. Citric acid is in oranges and in lemons and in grapefruit. So when you have lemon, lemon juice, lemonade, grapefruit juice, it's kind of sour, uh, and that's the citric acid. Another example is if you eat plain yogurt, yogurt that hasn't been sweetened with fruit or anything. So plain yogurt kind of tastes sour, right? And so does sour cream taste sour. Well, what is it in yog plain yogurt and sour cream that makes it taste sour? Lactic acid. And in fact, uh, you might have learned in biology, and you certainly will learn in microbiology, the way they produce uh, uh, yogurt and a, a sour cream is using a bacteria called lactobacillus. And that's how they make this. Uh, they turn the lactose sugar into lactic acid using that bacteria. So that creates a sour taste. So acids taste uh, sour. Salty. What makes something taste salty are salts. And I know your first thought is, thank you very much, that's so useful. But uh, what we mean by salt in the world of chemistry is a salt is a metal and a non-metal. So the most famous of all salts, sodium chloride, is a metal and a non-metal. And uh, there's a potassium chloride. In fact, potassium chloride is sold in the market as a salt substitute for people who are told that they shouldn't eat regular salt. They need to reduce their sodium or salt intake. They have potassium chloride, which also tastes kind of salty, a little bit bitter, but salty. And then sodium iodide, that's an iodized salt. Uh, anything that's a metal and a non-metal generally tastes salty. <laughs> Uh, what tastes bitter to us are certain complex organic molecules. And an example of a complex organic molecule that tastes really bitter is aspirin. If you put an aspirin tablet on your tongue, it tastes really bitter. And then uh, we mentioned about 12, 15 years ago, a group of Japanese researchers discovered a fifth taste called umami. These are chemoreceptors activated by amino acids. 
Now, an example of a chemical that activates these umami chemoreceptors is a derivative of an amino acid called MSG, monosodium glutamate. Monosodium glutamate is derived from glutamic acid, an amino acid. So MSG activates these amino acid uh, chemoreceptors. Uh, the word umami is a Japanese word usually translated as savory, meaty, brothy. And uh, so by activating them, it just kind of activates this other taste. Uh, uh, you, you'll notice that actually what these taste buds or chemoreceptors are really informing us about, we don't usually think of it this way, is they're telling us whether there's sugars in our food, whether there are amino acids in our food, uh, whether there are salts in our food, whether there are acids in our food, and as far as bitter, bitter, anything that tastes bitter might be, might be toxic or poisonous. So if you taste something that's bitter, you're probably going to spit it out because it doesn't taste right. And yeah, because some things that are toxic or poisonous taste bitter. So it's really to inform us about kind of what's in our food. On J12, so uh, we are reminded that, in, that our tongue is uh, a, a controlled by both intrinsic muscles and extrinsic muscles. The word intrinsic means inside, so intrinsic muscles are inside the tongue. We spoke about them on page I4 for the most recent muscle test. And uh, there's also extrinsic muscles that originate outside the tongue, such as the genioglossus and styloglossus, that stick our tongue out and retract our tongue back in. So those are extrinsic muscles. What is the lingual frenulum? Now, we said lingual means tongue. Anybody remember what's the word for uh, lip? Lingual means tongue. What word means Orange. lip? Orange. Labial. Labial. So to, earlier today, we said there's a superior labial frenulum. All right. In fact, I passed this picture out, right? I just colored mine in with uh, yellow here. But, uh, you'll notice that here on the underside of the tongue, right along the midline on the underside of the tongue, is the lingual frenulum. That's the fold of skin on the underside of your tongue. So uh, we previously mentioned the labial frenulum. So don't confer confuse the word labial with lingual. Labial means lip, lingual means tongue. Um, now, uh, back on uh, J12, so on J12, uh, we wrote the root of the tongue is attached to the epiglottis. And so here's the tongue. And so the back of the tongue is attached to the epiglottis. We're going to be learning about that. You'll notice that here looking at the tongue, what do we call the tip of the tongue? The apex. Earlier today, we learned the term apical foramen of a root canal, right? And we said apex or apical means tip. And I said that you're going to see that root keep reappearing. Now, uh, here on this picture, there are the palatine tonsils right here on the sides. And then there's another tonsil covering the top back surface of your tongue called the lingual tonsil. Lingual means tongue. In fact, in terms of tonsils, in terms of tonsils, at the bottom, under lingual tonsil, so I've written here, and I'll give you a chance to uh, write it, we actually have three sets of tonsils, three sets of tonsils. We have the palatine tonsils, the lingual tonsil, and a third one is the pharyngeal tonsil. Where's the palatine tonsil? That's right here on the sides. Where's the lingual tonsil? Right here on the top back surface. Now, what about this third one, the pharyngeal tonsil? The pharyngeal tonsil is at the back of your nose in an area called the nasopharynx. It's at the back of our nose. We're going to see another picture shortly showing you where the, uh, the pharyngeal tonsil is. Now, what are tonsils for? I had mentioned earlier that they took my... Uh, tonsils out. In fact, they, when I was a kid, they removed both my palatine tonsils 
and my pharyngeal tonsil. They don't take, they never took the lingual tonsil on the back top surface of the tongue, but that was very common to remove the palatine and the pharyngeal tonsil. So uh, they don't, we said they don't, are reluctant to do that today because now we know they are not vestigial organs with no function. They are part of our immune system. So what are inside the tonsils? Why are tonsils part of our immune system? Inside our tonsils are macrophages and lymphocyte white blood cells. Now macrophages are just big cells, big eaters. That's literally what it means. Macro means big, phage mean, like, means to phagocytize, to swallow up. Big eaters. Uh, they swallow up bad guys. There's also lymphocyte white blood cells. Lymphocyte white blood cells are very important in our immune response. Now where you're going to learn all about the lymphocyte white blood cells is for those of you who have to take microbiology. You're going to have an entire unit on the immune system and the immune response. It's very, very complex. But uh, one of the functions of the lymphocyte white blood cells, specifically the B lymphocytes, the B cells, is they produce antibodies. And what are antibodies? Antibodies are proteins. They are proteins that inactivate foreign agents. That's what antibodies do. They are proteins that inactivate foreign agents. Now, how do they inactivate foreign agents? That's a subject for immunology in your microbiology class. It gets complicated. Another name for antibodies, these proteins that inactivate foreign agents, and by foreign agents I mean anything that's foreign to our body, is that in micro they call them immunoglobulins. The ending globulin, globulin or globin, always means protein. You might remember where we've used that term globin or globulin before, such as uh, myoglobin and hemoglobin. Globin, globulin always means a protein. So uh, in micro they will call antibodies immunoglobulins. Another name uh, is gamma globulin. That also refers to these antibodies. Now, uh, uh, even though the tonsils, and let's think about where the tonsils are located. So the tonsils are located on the sides of our mouth, on the inside of our mouth. They're on the back of our tongue and the back of our nose. I see them as strategically located because, look, inside the tonsils are all these white blood cells designed to defend us against bad guys. So, notice where there, we find these tonsils. They are located strategically right at the portals, entry points, where bad guys tend to enter our body. How do bad guys enter our body? Through our mouth and through our nose. These are the portals. Remember we talked about in the skin, there's the, uh, uh, four or five portals into the inside of the body. So right in the mouth is where you've got all these defense, the whole defense system, the immune response, just waiting to defend us against bad guys, bacteria, viruses that enter through the mouth. At the back of our nose, in the pharyngeal tonsil, another uh, tonsil filled with macrophages and lymphocytes to defend us against any bacteria or viruses that enter through our nose. So they are strategically located, is the way I visualize it. Now, if the palatine tonsils become enlarged, which they do when they're fighting bad guys, they enlarge, they produce more macrophages and lymphocytes, that's called tonsillitis. Again, in the, quote, old days, when people would have swollen tonsils, uh, the doctors would say, you know, they, we you don't really need them, and they used to remove them. That was called a tonsillectomy, removal of the palatine tonsils. Again, today, they're more reluctant to remove them. If the pharyngeal tonsil at the back of the nose became enlarged, that was called adenoids. So an adenoids is the term for an enlarged pharyngeal tonsil. And uh, they used to remove the pharyngeal tonsil as well. In fact, they removed both, my palatine tonsil and the pharyngeal tonsil. It used to be a package deal. And they just said, we're just going to go and whip all of those out of your mouth, uh, mouth and nose. They never removed the, uh, the uh, uh, lingual tonsil on the uh, top back surface of the tongue. All right, so there are three sets of tonsils, and we will show you a picture with the pharyngeal tonsil very shortly. On J13, 
on J13, the salivary glands. Now, just as you have three sets of tonsils, you have three sets of salivary glands. And you can see them on this picture, and we can also see them on this handout that we gave you, right here. The uh, largest of the salivary glands, of the three, are the parotid salivary glands. Those are located right below the ear. And in fact, we mention, we mention on J13 that uh, what mumps is. Mumps is a viral infection of the parotid salivary glands. So if anybody has ever had the mumps, that's where this parotid salivary gland becomes enlarged. And you might have an enlarged parotid on one side of your uh, face or on both sides. They could both, but the right and the left uh, parotids could be enlarged. Uh, the, uh, we also have the submandibular salivary gland and the sublingual. In fact, in this picture, you can even see where the saliva comes out right through an opening. And there's actually a pair of openings on both sides of the lingual frenulum. So, in fact, if you were to look in a, th in a mirror, look at yourself in the mirror, raise your tongue up, you will see those two little openings where the saliva comes out from the sublingual salivary gland on both sides of the lingual frenulum. Okay, uh, now, uh, on J13... On J13, so we've mentioned the parotid salivary glands and the submandibular salivary glands and the sublingual, meaning under the tongue. And then I wrote all about saliva. Well, I'm really not going to tell you that much about saliva, but those of you going into dentistry or dental hygiene will have, hear a lot, a lot about saliva. Very, very important subject. The main function of saliva is that it's fluid that softens the food that we eat. And the example that I like to give of that is potato chips. If you eat potato chips, even after you crunch them up with your teeth, they have sharp edges. And if you were just to swallow these uh, pieces of potato chips down your throat, the sharp edges of the potato chip might cut the sensitive inside of your throat. What the saliva does is it softens the potato chip. So instead of having these sharp, brittle edges, it kind of becomes bendable and soft, the potato chips. So that's really the major benefit of saliva is to soften the food by wet wetting the food. However, there is enzymes in the saliva, and one of the enzymes that's in saliva that I've written here is an enzyme called salivary amylase. And in fact, one of the things, of course, you learn in a biology class is that when we name enzymes, they are given a suffix ending ace. That's always indicative that it's an enzyme. Now, what does salivary amylase do? It begins the process of digesting amylose. Another thing you learn in a college biology class is that carbohydrates... Are, usually have the suffix ending "-ose", to indicate that it's a carbohydrate, a kind of sugar. So uh, amylose uh, is a polysaccharide. It's a polysaccharide. It's really just made up of a whole bunch of uh, about 100 glucose molecules snapped together. It's a polysaccharide. What does poly mean? Many. many. Just, so it's just many sugars, many specific, precisely glucose molecules, join together. Amylose is the technical name for what we commonly call starch. So amylose is starch. Now what, what we learned earlier is that the whole process of digestion is to break apart those four major categories of organic or hydrocarbon molecules into simple nutrients. Carbs are going to be digested ultimately into what? monosaccharides, simple sugars. So right now, amylose or starch is a polysaccharide. So it's got to be totally broken apart into individual monosaccharides before we can absorb it. 
What salivary amylase does is it's an enzyme that starts splitting this polysaccharide into a disaccharide, di meaning two, two sugars, a disaccharide called maltose. Maltose is a disaccharide made up of two glucoses. In fact, if you take a piece of, if you take any food containing starch, such as bread, or a cracker, or a potato chip, they all have starch, amylose, just let it sit in your mouth for a couple of minutes, it'll start to taste sweeter. Have you ever noticed that? When you leave a piece of bread, a cracker, a potato chip in your mouth, it starts to taste a little bit sweet. Not real sweet, but a little bit. That's the starch being broken apart into maltose, which, starts, which has a slight sweet taste to it. So uh, the problem is we don't usually let the food sit in our mouth for very long before we swallow it. So as, in fact, this enzyme really doesn't end up digesting starch very much. Most of the digestion of starch is going to occur in our small intestine, but it begins the process. <clears throat> and that takes us to uh, J14. On J14, the palate, or roof of the mouth. So our first thought is, yeah, like who cares about the roof of our mouth? But in fact, the roof of your mouth, which separates your mouth from your nose, allows you to chew food and breathe at the same time. Think of a child that is born with a cleft palate, a hole in their roof of their mouth. That means that when they drink milk, the milk goes up into their nose and they can't breathe. So this is a real problem, so they have to surgically correct that cleft palate. So this allows us to breathe and chew at the same time. Now we previously learned that the front or anterior part is called the hard palate, and the back part is called the soft palate. On the roof of our palate are these ridges called palatine rugae, palatine rugae. And I kind of remember that term rugae for ridges, kind of like that, uh, you know, brand of potato chips, ruffles have ridges. So I figure if ruffles have ridges, so do rugae, R ridges. So uh, R for R. Uh, and then we know that the very back of the soft palate terminates in this U-shaped structure called a uvula, which is going to be needed for swallowing. Now, what is the fauces, or isthmus of fauces? I wrote it's the opening between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx. And I kind of wrote that this way, that uh, the fauces is this opening between the oral cavity and something called the oral pharynx. Well, let's look at the bottom picture. So in other words, when you open your mouth, there is this opening at the back of your mouth called the fauces that leads into the throat or oral pharynx. But the reason why they sometimes call that the isthmus of fauces, and you might say, where did you say that? Well, back on J14, sometimes it's called the isthmus of fauces. Has anybody ever heard that term, isthmus? The Panama Canal was built in the narrowest part of the land that separates the Atlantic Ocean from the Pacific Ocean. They call that really narrowed area of land in Panama the Isthmus of Panama in geography. The word Isthmus means narrow. So that's where they built the canal to allow ships to go from the Atlantic Ocean through that canal into the Pacific Ocean without having to go all the way around the bottom of South America. So they built that in the Isthmus of Panama. Isthmus means narrowing. So they sometimes call the fauces the Isthmus of fauces, the narrowing at the back. What we've written next is pharynx or throat. Uh, and we divide the pharynx or throat into three parts. An upper number one nasopharynx, a number two middle part called the oropharynx, and on the bottom of the next page, the very bottom, number three, the laryngopharynx. In fact, let's see this using this picture on J15. This picture, and you know, let me get your attention on this, 
How can I get your attention? Oh, I know. This picture will appear on the third exam. All right, good. Now I have your attention. This is a mid-sagittal section, a mid-sagittal section through the head and neck. The head and neck is really, really important. We, we've mentioned for people going into dentistry and dental hygiene in the first semester, you're going to have a head and neck anatomy course. But it's also very important for those of you going into nursing fields, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant, because what are passed through the mouth and nose are nasogastric tubes and endotracheal tubes, all kinds of tubes. You look down somebody's throat, you look down into their nose, you've got to understand the anatomy of this. So, uh, and I just, we showed you some videos that we have linked on my website where it shows them show, taking an endoscopic camera and going through the throat. So you need to understand what it is you're seeing. All right, so let's get our orientation. This is the nose, nasal cavities. This is the mouth, right here. What separates the nose from the mouth, the oral cavity, is this roof of the mouth called the palate. And you can see over here it's labeled the hard palate, and this is the soft palate. In fact, let's zoom in on it, this very bottom right here of the soft palate is the uvula. This is the uvula right here, this little thing dangling. Now, this is the throat. This is the throat right here, or pharynx. And so we call this upper part of the throat the nasopharynx. You'd say, is that labeled? right here where it says nasopharynx number one. So the up nasopharynx, this is the upper part of the throat. Why is it called nasopharynx? Because the air that you breathe goes through the nose and enters the upper part of the throat, the nasopharynx. Incidentally, right here on the back wall of the nasopharynx, this is the nasopharynx right here. Right here on the back wall is the pharyngeal tonsil. So we had said that we've got two of those sets of tonsils in your mouth, and the third tonsil is on the back of your nose, really the nasopharynx. So then any bad guys that come in through the nose, this area is loaded with macrophages and lymphocytes to defend us against the entry of bad guys. Now, here is the oral cavity. The tongue actually pushes the food back. It pushes the food back into the middle part of the throat. What do we call this middle part of the throat where the food is pushed back into? It's called the oropharynx, number two. Oral for the oral, oral like mouth. So we have the upper nasopharynx and the oropharynx. So what separates them by level is the uh, palate. Now, lower down, yet, down here, is the laryngopharynx, down here. You'd say, is that labeled? It's labeled right here, number three. The laryngopharynx is number three. So you can see there is the upper nasopharynx, the middle oropharynx, and the lower laryngopharynx. Now coming off the laryngopharynx, coming off it are two passageways, two passageways coming off the laryngopharynx. This passageway is labeled the esophagus. That's the food tube. So food is going to travel, food is going to travel, Food is going to travel from the laryngopharynx straight down this way, down the esophagus, to the stomach. On the other hand, air is going to follow these arrows. Air is going to flow from the laryngopharynx through these air, following these arrows, which I will analyze in more detail yet, into the larynx. This area right here is called the larynx, right here. You'd say it's the what? This area right here is the larynx. The vocal cords are right here. And in fact, the vocal cords are represented right here. 
So the air is going to flow from the laryngopharynx into this, through these vocal, between these vocal cords, the, through this slit, which we'll talk about. This is the larynx, and then here is the trachea, or windpipe. Now sometimes a tiny drop of fluid ends up going down the wrong passageway. And that's when you start, <coughs> and the expression is, I guess it went down the wrong pipe. And it was probably a single droplet of liquid. Just a tiny little droplet went down the wrong pipe, started heading to the lungs instead of going to the stomach. Because the food and drink are supposed to go from the laryngopharynx down the esophagus to the stomach. Now, uh, the, the, uh, we're going to be learning, and I'll take you through this in more detail in a moment, that uh, when we swallow, we've got two big problems. Uh, we don't want, when we have food and it's pushed to the back of our mouth, we don't want the food going up and coming out our nose. <laughs> All right? We don't want food to go into our throat and then go up and come out our nose. Uh, you'd say, well, could that ever happen? Yes. Uh, those of you who were uh, brought up as children in the United States, and I know some of you weren't, but here in the U.S. they do this funny kind of cute thing in kindergarten and first grade and second grade called milk time. And they have these little, little pints of milk and they give every kid a little straw and a pint, a little thing of milk. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And so during milk time for kindergarten and first grade, the kids have their little milk because it's good for you know, growing bones and teeth. And uh, the class clown will make the kids laugh. And when you start to laugh while you're drinking the milk, the milk comes out your nose. All right? So, but it's not, we don't, normally we don't want it to come out your nose. So we're going to be learning that the soft palate swings up. The purpose of this soft palate is to swing up so that the, what's here in your oral pharynx cannot go up into the nasal pharynx and come out your nose. And the other thing that's important, besides the uvula of the soft palate swinging up, swinging up like this, and we'll see pictures of that, is that in order to prevent the food and drink from going this way to, into the larynx and down the trachea, this thing right here called the epiglottis, the epiglottis is going to bend down. And as the epiglottis bends down, it acts like a lid and prevents the food and drink from going through the larynx and trachea so that the food and drink is forced to go from the laryngopharynx down the esophagus to the stomach. So the important thing that we're going to be drawing your attention to is the role of the uvula of the soft palate and the role of the epiglottis. The purpose of these is to make sure that what you swallow in terms of food and drink uh, don't go up your nose, and don't go into your lungs. So that's going to be very important. Before we get to that, though, uh, let's uh, learn a little bit more about the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So back on J14. On J14, so we wrote pharynx, nasopharynx on J14. And we wrote that the nasopharynx is lined by a ciliated mucous membrane. And our first thought is, yeah, what's that mean? All right, before I show you what it means, here's what we're trying to make a point of. In fact, wherever air is flowing, wherever air and only air, those passageways will be lined by a ciliated mucous membrane. So the nose is lined by a ciliated mucous membrane and the nasopharynx is lined by a ciliated mucous membrane because normally only air is going through your nose and normally only air is going through the nasopharynx. Now what does ciliated mucous membrane mean? This is a shorthand way on page uh, J14. The ciliated mucous membrane is a shorthand way of saying pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells. And you might say, say that again. Well, we already wrote it. It's on page D5, and we learned it. You'd say, you're kidding. No, I'm not. Let's take a look at page D5. Now, section D is histology. 
And we have said that we will return back to histology more than any other single section. So if we go back to page D5, this is page D5, tissue number 6, pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium with goblet cells, and what is written in parentheses and underlined? Ciliated mucous membrane. The ciliated, it, right, is just ciliated because it's a ciliated epithelium. Why is it called a mucous membrane? Because they're mucus secreting goblet cells. This is the tissue that lines the respiratory tract. So wherever there's air going through it. So, uh, again, on where we were, on uh, J15, so there's a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium with goblet cells lining the nasal cavity and the nasal pharynx. However, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx not only have air going through them, but also food. And food would just rip those delicate little cilia off. So where we have food going through, it has to be a tougher, more resilient tissue than the delicate ciliated mucous membrane. So in fact, the oropharynx and lower laryngopharynx are lined by the same tissue that's on the inside of your mouth, where there's also food, which is a non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. You'd say, did you write that? Yes, I did, on J14. So on J14, the oropharynx is lined by non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. That's the same tissue that lines the inside of our mouth. So wherever we have food going through it, it's this much tougher tissue. This is also the tissue that lines the lower laryngopharynx. You'd say, did you write that? Yes, I did, on the bottom of J15. On the bottom of J15, the laryngopharynx is also lined by the non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. Okay, wonderful. Now, back on J14. So then, on J14, go, still looking at nasopharynx, we wrote the word coene. And you'd say, what? The coene are also known as the posterior nares. The posterior nares. And you might say, what are you talking about? All right, so here's what I wrote. The right and left nasal cavities go through the right and left coene, which are also known as the right and left posterior nares. It means the same thing. These posterior nares are the same as the coene, and it flows into the nasopharynx. So we're thinking, what does that mean? All right, so let me try to explain what uh, this is. These oh, pair of openings at the front of our nose are known as nostrils or anterior nares. Nares on the anterior, the front side. Imagine, I'm not going to do this, but imagine I stuck my fingers right up my nostrils. I stick my fingers right up, and now they're in my right and left nasal cavities, right? And what separates the right nasal left nasal cavities from each other is the nasal septum or wall. If I push my fingers further and further back, they actually go through a hole at the back of the nose. That's called the posterior nerve. And they go through that posterior nares, and now they're in the nasopharynx, in, our, in the throat. So the air goes through the anterior nares, through the nasal cavities, through the posterior nares, into the throat, into the nasopharynx. So just as you have a pair of openings at the entry to your nasal cavities, you have a pair of openings at the back of your nasal cavities where the air enters your throat. These posterior nares are also called the coene. Okay, I like the term posterior nares better because you have anterior and posterior, but they're also known as coene. Now you might say, you got a picture of that? Yes, I do. <laughs> so let's show you a picture. Let's look on J16. 
This is J16. And our first thought is, what the heck is this? I'm going to explain it. What I'd like you to imagine is that you're looking at the back of my head and the back of my neck. And let's imagine we take a scalpel and we make a vertical incision on the back of my neck. I'm going to make a vertical cut. And now I'm, we're going to spread my neck open. We're going to spread it wide open, and you will be looking into my throat from the back side. Can you visualize that? You are looking into my throat from the back. That's what the throat looks like when it's open from the back. Here, this is the back of somebody's skull. Can you see that? And what we've done is we've we made a cut on the back of their neck, and we spread it wide open. This is the nasal septum. This is the nasal septum. It's labeled right here, nasal septum. Right here. And this opening here and here are called the posterior nares or coanae. These are the openings where the air enters your upper part of your throat. What do we call this upper part of the throat? The nasal pharynx. It's written right here. What do we call the middle part of the throat? The oral pharynx. What do we call the lower throat? The laryngopharynx. Now you might say, well, yeah, but what, the, what are these things? There's some things sticking out there. What the heck are those? The conchi. You'd say, excuse me, the who? The conchi. You'd say, what? The shelves. Look on the previous page. Do you remember the superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi? So these are projections, things sticking out into the nasal cavity. So in this picture, these are these things sticking out, these conchi. But anyhow, for our purposes at the moment, that's less important than the openings. So the openings are the posterior nares, or coanae. So the air it comes right out through these openings. Incidentally, if I stuck my fingers in this way, they go into the nasal cavities and they come out the front of your nose. These are the openings at the back of the nose where the air is coming into the throat. Incidentally, in this picture, here is the soft palate. Right here, uh, this is the uvula. And down here, you can see Here's the laryngopharynx. There's two tubes coming off. This is the esophagus tube where the food's going down. And this right here is the trachea tube where the air is going down. So we're just trying to help you understand this head and neck area. <clears throat> Let's go back to J14. So back, and you've got all these pictures in color using the links that are on my website as well as endoscopy and all kinds of other things. So on J14, the next thing we wrote associated with the nasopharynx are the eustachian canals, or auditory tubes. And I remind you, because we actually learned about this a while ago, we learned that the eustachian canals, also known as the auditory tubes, These are tubes that allow air to flow from the nasal pharynx into the middle ear. So air can flow from the nasal pharynx through these auditory tubes, these right and left auditory tubes or eustachian canals, into the middle ear. And we may be thinking, what? Well, in fact, we learned about this back in section E on page E5, right here. All right, so let's look at page E5. This was page E5. Some of you might remember this. You'd say, yeah, what was this all about? So here, around the middle of page E5, here it shows a eustachian tube or auditory tube. We said the air can go from your throat through this tube into the middle ear. 
And we have explained why it needs to do that, because the air pressure here has to be the same as the air pressure on the outside of your ear, because if the air pressure in the middle of your ear, in the middle ear, is different than on the outside of your ear, then you'll get this uh, popping sensation. So, in fact, that happens when you're in an airplane and it takes off. It also happens when you're in a car and you drive up into the mountains. When you, there's this change in atmospheric pressure on the outside of your body, now the air pressure on the outside of your body is different than in your middle ear, and you get that popping sensation. So we said you've got to kind of inflate your cheeks. You've got to chew gum. You've got to yawn. You've got to get air to move. So, back on J14, back on J14, uh, we have been talking about what lines the nasopharynx, the posterior nares, and how the air flows into the nasopharynx. The right and left eustachian canals are auditory tubes that carry air to the middle ear and the pharyngeal tonsil. On J J15, we can actually see the pharyngeal tonsil label, and it's right here on the back wall or posterior wall of the nasopharynx. We had explained that there we have three sets of tonsils. Two of the sets of tonsils are at the uh, form a ring around the back of our mouth. Those are the palatine tonsils on the back sides of our mouth, our oral cavity, and a lingual tonsil on the top back surface of our tongue. The third tonsil is on the back of our nose, really on the back wall of the nasopharynx. We explained last time these are located strategically to defend us against bad guys because what's inside the tonsils, we learned, are macrophages and lymphocyte white blood cells that defend us against bad guys. And these are two major entry points for bad guys. We take in bacteria and viruses through our mouth, and we got tonsils there, and bacteria and viruses enter as we breathe air through our nose. So we see they're located strategically right where bad guys could enter into our body to defend, act as a line of defense against uh, these bad guys uh, uh, invading the body. Um, let's look at, and we wrote this on J14, let's look at page K3. And K, section K is on the respiratory system. So on the bottom picture of K3, this is just, again, the similar picture cut away mid-sagittal section of uh, the head, just showing it an even larger, page K3 at the bottom. And here, uh, this is the uh, nasal cavity. The air would flow right through the anterior nares, through the nasal cavity, and then this is the nasopharynx. Right here on the back wall, the posterior wall of the nasopharynx, is that pharyngeal tonsil. We learned last time, incidentally, uh, that if the pharyngeal tonsil becomes enlarged, that's referred to as the adenoids. We had mentioned adenoids is the term we use for pharyngeal, enlarged pharyngeal tonsil. Uh, the, uh, I want to direct your attention right here, because right here it says opening to the auditory tube, which are also known as the eustachian canals. Now, if I could stick my finger right into the screen, it, there literally would be an opening right there, and I can literally put my finger right into a tube right there. That's, there are two openings. There's a right and left auditory tube, or eustachian canal. But that allows air to flow from the nasopharynx through these eustachian canals, or auditory tubes, <laughs> to the middle ear. And that's to allow the air pressure in the middle ear to become the same as on the outside of our body so we can hear properly. So you should go back and review page uh, E4 and E5. And we even pointed out that, that also explains how you end up with a middle ear infection, which is clinically called otitis media. Um, okay, so back on page J14. So on J14, uh, we've been speaking about the nasopharynx, told you what tissue lines it, mentioned the posterior nares or coenae, uh, the eustachian canals or auditory tubes that allow air to flow from the nasopharynx uh, to the middle ear, and uh, the pharyngeal tonsil on the back wall of the nasopharynx. And if it's enlarged, it's called the adenoids. Then the middle part of the throat. Now, the middle part of the throat 
is lined by a much tougher tissue, non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. In fact, this is the tissue that we see lining those places in the body where food goes through it. So this is the tissue that has uh, lined the inside of your mouth, the inside of your cheek. Isn't it epidermis? Isn't it skin? And since it's skin on the inside of our mouth, not skin on the outside of our body, it's non-keratinizing, as opposed to keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. This is a much tougher tissue than a delicate ciliated mucous membrane. Because uh, if, the, uh, if our inside of our mouth was lined with little cilia, the food would just rip off or tear these delicate little cilia. Uh, we find this tissue not only lining the inside of our mouth, but again, wherever food passes through, including the middle part of our throat, the oropharynx, as well as the lower part of our throat, the laryngopharynx. As, uh, uh, so uh, that's what we find lining that. Uh, we uh, remind you that the opening, the passageway between the oral cavity and the oral pharynx is called the fossies. And right here on the sides of the oral cavity, there are these little pink eyes, the palatine tonsils, as well as a tonsil on the top back surface of the tongue, the lingual tonsil. On the bottom of J15, on the uh, bottom of J15, So we mentioned on the bottom of J15 the laryngopharynx. So both the oropharynx and laryngopharynx are lined by that non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. You see food is going to go from the oral cavity through the oropharynx, through the laryngopharynx, and down into the esophagus. So all of that's lined by that tougher non-keratinizing stratified squamous epithelium. Now we also wrote at the bottom right here, something called the laryngeal aperture. What did I say the word aperture means? Opening. opening. It means an opening. It is an opening for the passage of air, allowing air to flow from the laryngopharynx, the lower part of the throat, to the, uh, to the larynx. Now the larynx, of course, is we all commonly call the larynx the voice box, right? The voice box because that's where your vocal cords are. And incidentally, as a side note, it is properly called larynx, not larynx. The, or, the order of the letters is larynx, not la larynx, larynx. Uh, and uh, laryngopharynx, laryngeal aperture, and larynx. Uh, all right, so what is that? So let me show you in a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, right here. So this is the lower part of the throat, or laryngopharynx, right? Right here, the lower part of the throat. Can you see where I drew some arrows, two arrows right here? Now, this right here is the larynx, or voice box. And in your larynx, or voice box, is, uh, are these vocal cords. These are the vocal cords shown right here. And there is a slit, an opening between the vocal cords, and that slit is called the glottis. The glottis is a slit between the vocal cords. We even wrote that. Now, first of all, I think we did this last time, but let's make sure we know where our own larynx or voice box is. So we'll just feel this hard bulge right uh, on your neck. That's your larynx. Inside it are your vocal cords. If you hum, you'll feel it vibrate. <laughs> it's vibrating there because that's where your vocal cords are. Now, the air, of course, has got to go from your throat through this larynx and then right below your larynx, go ahead and feel it. That's your trachea or windpipe below that. So, the, uh, so here we have the larynx. Here's the trachea or windpipe right below it. So the air goes from the laryngopharynx, the lower part of the throat, through an opening called the laryngeal aperture. And that word is written right here. The laryngeal aperture is this opening or passageway for the air to flow into the larynx. And then the air is going to flow right through this glottis slit between the vocal cords and then down through the trachea. I'm going to review how air flows in just a moment, but let's just remind you of a couple of pictures. First, on J16. On J16, 
Here it's labeled, boxed in, the laryngeal aperture. This is the laryngeal aperture. This is the opening. If I could stick my finger down, downwards, it would be inside this area right here, right? That's the larynx. The vocal cords are right in here. But let's see a picture that shows this even better. So on K6, so here is the laryngeal aperture, this opening right here. And we are looking down into the larynx. And here, as we look down, we can see the vocal cords. Here they are. The vocal cords are skeletal muscles because we have voluntary control over our vocal cords. Okay? So we can control them voluntarily. And there is a slit between the vocal cords called the glottis slit. And the air flows right through that. So uh, uh, if somebody needs to be intubated, if they are going to insert an endotracheal tube, the tube is pushed through their mouth, and it's got to go down into the trachea. The trachea is down here. And so they're going to have to go right through that slit between the vocal cords to get that tube down into the trachea. All right? So let's kind of summarize uh, uh, this. Let's go back to J15. So on J15, let's use this picture to trace how does food go through uh, our, our uh, throat and how does air go through the throat. So uh, let's, let's first speak about uh, air. Now, whether we breathe the air through our nose, whether we're nose breathers, breathers, or mouth breathers, in either case, the air goes through the nose or the mouth into the throat. If we breathe through the nose, it enters through the nasopharynx. If we go through the mouth, it enters a little lower down in the oropharynx. OK, but in either case, it flows down. Now, the air flows down through the laryngopharynx, the lower part of the throat, and then what does it do? It goes through that opening, represented by these two arrows called the laryngeal aperture, into the larynx. And then, uh, right inside the larynx, we just showed you other pictures where there's those vocal cords, the air's going to flow right through that slit between the vocal cords called the glottis slit, and then it'll flow down the trachea, down into our lungs. So you should understand the passage, how air flows through our, our throat and how it gets to our trachea. Okay, again, laryngopharynx, laryngeal aperture, glottis slit between the vocal cords and trachea. So uh, that's, that's how it's flowing. Now, how about food? How does food travel? Now, there are two big challenges with food. The food, of course, uh, goes into our mouth our tongue is going to push the food backwards, and the food will go through from our oral cavity into the oral pharynx. And we know this narrowed opening between the oral cavity and oral pharynx is called the isthmus of fauces, or for short, fauces. That's the opening at the uh, back, right? You can see that opening when you open your mouth all the way. You see that narrow opening at the very back that the food has to go through to get into your throat. Now, here's the problem. If the food is in the oral pharynx, we don't want the food going up and coming out your nose. So what prevents the food from going up into the nasopharynx and possibly coming out your nose? And we mentioned last time, sometimes that has happened when you started to laugh while drinking milk, and the milk started coming out your nose. Uh, it doesn't have to be milk. It could be something else. But anyhow, the, the, uh, what prevents it is the soft palate. This soft palate, specifically the uvula, swings up. And as it swings up, now the food is blocked from going up into the nasopharynx and coming out your nose. We'll see all this is written down in a moment. The second problem is, fine, now the food can't go up because the soft palate swings up. We don't want the food to go through the laryngeal aperture, go through the larynx, and go down the wrong pipe into our trachea and into our lungs. Occasionally that happens, just like food, something coming out your nose. Uh, occasionally we drink something very quickly, and a tiny droplet of water or something goes down the wrong pipe, and we start <coughs> <coughs> And it was probably a single little droplet went down the wrong pipe. Most of the time, it all works perfectly. 
What prevents the food or drink from going down the wrong pipe is this epiglottis. Epiglottis. Epi means on top. It's a t on top of the glottis. Okay? The epiglottis is like a little lid, and it bends down when we swallow. And as it bends down, it, it basically blocks any food or drink from going through the laryngeal aperture, through the larynx, and down into the trachea. As this epiglottis bends down, the food is directed down the esophagus. Well, let's show you where I've summarized all this for you. Uh, if, if we look on page um, J17, so we wrote on J17, the swallowing or deglutition reflex. The word deglutition means swallowing. Yes, you should know that. Yes, we learned that last time. Anybody remember what we used, said that word last time? When we talked about the tongue. We did, they said that was one of the functions of our tongue. And in fact, what's the first thing I said happens in the swallowing reflex? Your tongue pushes that bolus of food, a bolus just means a volume of food, to the back of our mouth through that fauces. All right? Then, the number two, the nasopharynx becomes blocked by the uvula of the soft palate. We explained that it swings up to prevent the food or drink from going up to the nasopharynx and then coming out your nose. The third thing we wrote is the epiglottis bends down to prevent the food from going through the laryngeal aperture and ending up going down through your vo uh, voice box, your larynx, down into your trachea. And then, number four, the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. And when we were learning about muscles of our throat in section I, we called <laughs> these muscles of our throat the constrictor pharynges. They contract, which constricts. It squeezes our throat and pushes the food down into the esophagus. And in fact, in this picture here, so this food is just pushed down the esophagus, and there is a peristaltic contraction that uh, creates a contractile wave that pushes the food down the esophagus to the stomach. And uh, we explain how peristaltic contractions work. You'd say, when? Page H17. When we were talking about visceral smooth muscle, we explained that all visceral smooth muscle cells are electrically joined together by what are called intercalated discs or gap junctions. And as that electrical current spreads from one cell to the next, it, uh, they contract in that sequential order, creating a kind of wave, a pushing action that pushes the food down. Uh, so that's the swallowing reflex. We had pictures that we passed out to you uh, last time. They look like this. Here we can see in figure one, uh, here's the bolus of food. The tongue is pushing the food to the back. In figure two, we see that the food is entering the oropharynx. Notice how the soft palate is blocking the passageway so that you can see here it was open, but now it's blocked. The food cannot go up into the nasopharynx and come out the nose. I want to direct your attention. Here is the epiglottis right here, because when we get to figure three, in figure three, you can see the bolus of food is being pushed down in the swallowing reflex, and this epiglottis is going to bend downwards, preventing the food from going through the larynx and down into the trachea. That we can see in figure four. Right? Here's the epiglottis. It's bent down. The food is being pushed. The constrictor pharyngeus muscle is uh, con contracting, squeezing the food, and it's going down the esophagus. And by the time we get to figure five, so the food is going down the esophagus. And then as the food heads towards the stomach, notice in this last figure six, the epiglottis swings back up. This soft palate or uvula swings down. And now air can flow through the throat uninterruptedly through the laryngeal aperture, through the uh, larynx, down into the trachea. But obviously what this means is when you're swallowing, you can't breathe. You momentarily stop breathing when you swallow. 
right? Because if you were breathing, if you could breathe when you were swallowing, the food would end up going down the wrong pipe. So that's part of this built-in reflex, the swallowing reflex, which works most of the time. Again, I want to remind you, all of these pictures you can see in color on my video that I made. And it shows it much nicer, and I strongly recommend you take a look at it. If somebody needed to be intubated, and again, we've got a video showing this linked on my website. So that endotracheal tube is passed through the mouth, uh, through the oropharynx, through the laryngopharynx. Now it's called an endotracheal tube. It's got to get to the trachea. So then it's pushed through this uh, laryngeal <laughs> aperture. Then it goes right through this slit, this opening between the two vocal cords called the glottis slit, and then it's into the trachea. 